Okay, welcome back. We're about to begin a new chapter. This is on chemical equilibrium. Equilibrium is a pretty important chemical concept. We spend um, probably six or seven weeks on equilibrium and advanced placement next year. This year we're just going to touch on the concept and we'll have a couple of different applications before the end of the year. Um, the first part of the chapter begins talking or re reviewing some rate laws. Um, I've decided that I'm not going to go over this with you um, on the video. It might be better off if we spend some time talking about this in class. I think what I want to do is jump right into um, what equilibrium is um, as opposed to giving you that background immediately. So let's consider a very simple reaction. We have reactants A and B forming products C and D and we see the arrow going both ways. Now we've seen that before. Um, that states that the reaction has reached something called equilibrium. Now as the reaction proceeds towards equilibrium, the concentration of the species would vary like this graph. For instance, reactants A and B would actually begin to decrease in their concentration. So as this reaction begins from time zero, reactants A and B are turning into C and D. So the concentrations of A and B begin to drop. The concentrations of C and D, my products, of course, immediately begin to rise. And as time goes on, A and B continue to drop, C and D continue to increase. And we will reach a point where the concentrations of the two products no longer change. So as we see in the second graph here, once again, there's a little mistake here, that's C and D. This should read A and B. The concentration, as the concentration of my reactants drop, the concentration of my products increase. And as my reactants continue to drop, my products continue to increase, and so on and so on and so on. And finally, we reach a point, and I would say on this graph, it's right about here, where the concentration of my products is no longer changing, and the concentration of my reactants is no longer changing. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not making any more product. I am. But the rate, and this is the important part, the rate at which the product is formed is equal to the rate at which it's decomposing and turning back into reactant. So A and, um, A and B drop, and right about here you can see their concentration stays the same. C and D increase, and right about here you can see their concentration uh, stays the same. Now, what's happening at this point is A and B are still turning into products C and D. But remember, when we're at equilibrium, the products convert back into the reactants as well. So my products C and D are also converting back into A and B at the same rate. So we say when that occurs, equilibrium has been achieved. Once again, that does not mean that C and D are no longer being created. They are. But as fast as they're being created, they're decomposing and turning back into reactants. We reach an equilibrium. We're used to seeing reactions going only in one direction, where I use up all my reactants and I turn them all into products. But in this case, you can see that I still have, I maintain a certain concentration of reactants as I maintain a certain concentration of my products. Now, the graph doesn't always have to look like this. Let's take another one for instance. So here are A and B. There might be a small drop in A and B before they reach equilibrium. And of course, when they drop, C and D increase. And we can see equilibrium is achieved right about here. Now, once again, it doesn't mean that their concentrations are the same. It just means that the rate at which my products are being formed is the same rate as which my products are being decomposed and turning back into reactants. Let me give you one more example. Okay, so A and B could drop a whole bunch before it reaches equilibrium. And of course, that would mean C and D would rise a whole bunch before equilibrium is achieved. And you can see equilibrium occurs right around there. Now, in general, for a reaction, A molecules of A and B molecules of B and so on turn into C molecules of C and D molecules of D, we can write what's called an equilibrium expression. That equilibrium expression would be 
the concentration of my product raised to the coefficient as an exponent times my other product, big D, raised to its coefficient. Okay, so I put the products on top and the coefficients in the balanced equation become the exponents in the equilibrium expression. My reactants end up on the bottom, so I have a to the a power and big B to the lowercase b problem. So we have a ratio of products to reactants. Now it turns out if this ratio is really big, let's say it's much greater than 1, that means I have a high amount of products on top. And remember, if my products are high, that means my reactants must be low. So if that equilibrium constant is bigger than 1, it means I have lots of product at equilibrium and a very small amount of reactant. But what would happen if that equilibrium constant were really tiny? What if it were really small, much smaller than 1? Then, at equilibrium, I would have a low amount of products on top and a high amount of reactant remaining when it reaches equilibrium. Let's take a look at these graphs back here. For instance, do you notice here that my reactant drops just a little bit, so I have lots of reactant remaining at equilibrium and a small amount of product? Here, my equilibrium constant would be smaller than 1. Up here, do you see how I have a lot of product and a small amount of reactant once I reach equilibrium? Here we would say the equilibrium constant would be greater than 1. So the size of our equilibrium constant can help us determine how much product I have relative to the amount of reactant at equilibrium. It's a pretty important number. Now, this is known as an equilibrium expression when I put products over reactants like that. And is always true for a given reaction at a given temperature. In fact, a change in temperature is the only thing that changes the mathematical value of an equilibrium expression. Now think about this and remember it. What's the only thing that changes the numerical value of the equilibrium constant for a particular reaction? That would be a change in temperature. It's important to note that the species shown in the equilibrium expression are expressed in terms of molarity. Now remember, molarity is moles of solute dissolved in a liter of solution. Therefore, solids and liquids are never part of the equilibrium expression because their amounts cannot be expressed in terms of molarity. They're not homogeneously dispersed in the reaction container, so solids and liquids are left out of an equilibrium expression. Now I'm predicting you're probably going to forget that, but try to remember the only things included are things that we can express in terms of molarity, and those are things that are dissolved in water or gases in a container. So gases and ions or molecules dissolved in water can be expressed in terms of molarity. So these are the only species that we show in the equilibrium expression. Try to remember this, although I'm predicting you will forget. So let's start with a pretty simple problem. Let's write the equilibrium expression for this reaction here. We'll start out with Keq equals, and think about what goes on top. Think about this up here products go on top. And I can express that in terms of concentration. So these brackets, remember, mean concentration in terms of molarity. And the coefficient in the balanced equation becomes the exponent in the equilibrium expression. And my reactants go on the bottom. N2 and H2. Now I'm going to put H2 to the third power because that's the coefficient in the balanced equation. And that becomes the exponent in the equilibrium expression. So this would be the equilibrium expression for this reaction. Now you try one on your own. Take a minute and write the equilibrium expression for this reaction. 2C and O2 react to form 2CO. Pause this video and try it. Okay, let's see what you did. Hopefully you started out with KEQ. Did you put the concentration of your product on top and square it? And then I'll bet many of you put carbon on the bottom and squared it 
and oxygen gas also on the bottom. If you did this, you are wrong. Think about why. Carbon is a solid. What did we say we leave out of equilibrium expressions? Solids and liquids. So the appropriate expression for this would be the concentration of CO squared over the concentration of oxygen gas. That would be the appropriate equilibrium expression for this reaction above. Once again, just as a reminder, if KEQ is a number that's bigger than 1, what does that mean about this reaction? Well, if KEQ is bigger than 1, doesn't that mean I have a lot of product, my numerator is bigger than my denominator. So I have a lot of product relative to reactant. If KEQ is less than 1, that means my numerator is smaller than my denominator. That means I have a small amount of product that has been created relative to the reactant that's been decomposed. All right. Hopefully, uh, you didn't fulfill my prof uh, prophetic uh, statement that you would forget, but oftentimes many kids do. Okay, we're going to end part one here because part two, I want to do a little bit of arithmetic with our equilibrium expression and the value of our equilibrium constant. So we're going to stop part one here, and we'll begin part two next.